Chapter 5 Squire Feather was an unpleasant man to look upon. A quarter of his teeth were missing, victims of his violent temper and proclivity for engaging in fierce brawls when deep in his cups. His nose had been bent at an awkward angle by some bruiser's fist, spoiling the symmetry of his face. As though not already ugly enough to look upon, the squire's skin had contracted a livid red rash, some noxious yet non-lethal reminder of the dread red pox that had once decimated Musilon. It was a commonly held superstition in the cursed city that a blood blight only affected the cruelest and most wicked of the city's population, a curse visited upon evil souls by the lady herself. Fader did little to discredit such superstitions. The squire was seated behind a crude table formed by placing a rotting board atop a pair of barrels. A third barrel offered the thug a place to sit. His bleary gaze was only partially focused upon the set of iron scales that had been set upon the table. The corn farmers were obliged to provide a full measure every week during the harvest for their masters, a measure that had to match the one which balanced the scales. It was an unspoken understanding between squire and peasant, and there was a lead bar hidden within the bundle of corn which the farmers had to balance. Feather felt the pretense of doing things honestly would be a waste of everybody's time. Today, however, Feather had even less interest in the proceedings than usual. The squire looked around him, studying the narrow streets that opened into the old hay market. Soon, the dirty little square would be resounding to the sounds of battle, the screams of the dying, the pleas of the wounded. Feather smiled in anticipation. He appreciated combat, looked forward to it like a lover's embrace. The squire shifted his gaze to take in the four black-garbed men-at-arms who stood near the table, leaning on their spears with faint boredom, but whose eyes were watching the streets every bit as keenly as the squire's. Mariman's lackey, Sir Corbus, was expected to arrive before Feather had concluded his collection of tribute, at least so his master had told him. Feather dearly hoped that a brutal champion would show, because he had another twenty men hidden within the building that faced the square. Even Corbus would have trouble dealing with such odds. It was a pity that his master's orders did not allow for Fader to remove Merriman's champion once and for all, because the squire was certain that this time such a feat could be accomplished. Still, orders were orders and Fader had seen far too often what became of those who displeased his master. The frightened screams of peasants brought the squire out of his reverie. The smile grew broader on his ugly face, and he loosened his sword in its sheath. A trickle of peasants ran into the square, hastening toward the lanes that exited on the far side. Those farmers who had already began to present their goods became panicked as well, joining the newcomers in their flight. Feather did not try to hinder them. They would only get in the way of what was coming, and besides that fact, few of the farmers had had a presence of mind to recover their crops before fleeing. The source of the peasants' alarm was a group of armed men, only five in number. Sir Corbus had a very high opinion of himself, and would have deemed it beneath him to take any more soldiers along with him on his sordid little raid than he was expecting to face. The knight's arrogant contempt for his adversaries was one of the most predictable things about him. Feather smiled as he watched the minions of Duke Merrimond stalk into the square, their steps sure and certain, as though they were within their own district not deep within that of another of Musilon's ruling nobles. Merriman's soldiers were armed and equipped slightly better than Feather's. Each of the four halberdiers flanking Corbus wore a shirt of chainmail beneath his crimson and grey mantle and the kettle helms that shadowed their faces 
did not display the same signs of wear and rust that Feather might have expected to see. Sir Corbus himself was an imposing sight, fully a head taller than any of his men, his towering stature enhanced by the steel wings that formed the crest of his helmet. The knight wore a suit of armor that had been stained a dark crimson, every inch of the breastplate and greaves engraved so as to resemble the scaly hide of a serpent. The face that glared outward from the open face of the knight's helm was at once handsome and feral, like some great beast masquerading as a prince of men. Sir Corbus lifted his sword, snarling an unintelligible command to his soldiers, pointing his sword at Feather. Despite the lurking troops awaiting only his word to spring the trap, the squire felt the color drain from his face as the fiery eyes of Corbus burned into his own. Suddenly, he was not quite so eager to accept the imposing knight's challenge. Perhaps it would have been better to have brought thirty men, even forty. Feather began to back away from the table, the sudden motion causing his chair to tumble onto its side and roll away. The squire's bodyguard watched their leader's nervous reaction, uncertainty written on their faces. Don't just stand there, the squire hissed. Protect the tribute, you fools! The four men-at-arms lifted their spears, shuffling forward to place themselves between Merriman's men and the sacks of corn that had already been collected. Corbus paused in his steps to utter a laugh fairly dripping with contempt. He interposed his blade before the nearest of his own soldiers, motioning for his henchmen to hang back. Feather marveled, as he watched the Crimson Knight stride forward once the advance of his men had been halted. Surely, even Corbus was not so arrogant as to face four spearmen by himself. Corbus gestured with his blade once more, pointing it toward Feather. Despite the distance involved, the squire flinched. I allow you the honor of facing me, the knight's voice bellowed like the roar of a lion. Impress me, and I shall show you mercy. Feather backed away from the imposing warrior, sweat trickling down his broken features. After a moment, he composed himself, snapping his gaze from Sir Corbus to his own spearman. What are you waiting for? the squire cried. You are four to his one. Kill him! The spearman cast worried looks on the glowering red knight then slowly, almost reluctantly, began to approach him. As they did so, the soldiers spread out, seeking to enclose their adversary within a semicircle of spear points. Corbus did not react to their approach beyond a twisting of his lip and a disappointed sigh. The knight kept his intense gaze fixed upon Feather, who now had his back to the warped wooden wall of the old storehouse. His eyes still bore into the squires when the first spearman attacked. The soldier to the extreme left of Corbus thrust with his weapon for the comparatively weak joint between the armor plates that enclosed the knight's front and those that guarded his back. It was one of those few places where a spear might be expected to penetrate the armor and injure the man within. The man-at-arms, however, did not anticipate the speed and agility of his enemy. With an almost inhuman snarl, Sir Corbus spun, lashing out with his sword, parrying the weapon with such force that the spearhead, a nearly a foot of wooden shaft, was severed from the attacker's weapon. Unbalanced, the soldier fell to the ground, staring with horror at his mutilated spear. Hoping to capitalize upon the attack of his comrade, the spearman to Corvus's right thrust his own weapon at the knight's back as he spun. Yet as the soldier struck, the knight was recovering from his own attack. Corvus bent at the knees, dropping into a crouch that let the spear stab harmlessly into the empty air. As he bent, the knight also spun his body, bringing the murderous edge of his sword sweeping around. 
the sharp steel edge passed beneath the outthrust spear, knowing for the leg of the man who wielded it. The soldier spilled to the ground, shrieking, as he held the bleeding stump that had once been his knee. The other spearmen hastily fell back to their original position, risking worried glances back toward their leader. The disarmed soldier scrambled up from the ground, hurrying to rejoin his companions. Corbus noted the sudden movement, and with astonishing speed fell upon the fleeing man, his sword slashing downward and opening the soldier's back. The man pitched to the dirt in a bloodied heap that moaned and writhed in its death agonies. From his position near the storehouse, Feather had watched the entire gruesome display. He closed his gaping mouth, snapping out of his horrified fascination. The squire drew his own weapon now, but made no move to draw any closer to the knight who had challenged him. Instead, the squire gestured with his naked blade toward the buildings that opened into the old hay market. His signal given, the lurking troops that had been hidden within burst forth, spears, swords and axes, gripped in their sweaty fists. Now you'll see what happens to curs who nip at their master's hands, Feather shouted, emboldened by the now overwhelming numbers he commanded. Corbus reacted to the sudden appearance of twenty armed men in the colors of his enemy with little more concern than he had shown to Feather's spearmen. The Red Knight stalked back toward his own halberdiers, who were themselves slowly forming into a defensive circle. Still, Corbus fixed Feather with a look that was more murderous than any the squire had ever met. Feather reconsidered his original intention to join his men in the attack. He'd stay back and coordinate things from a position where he might better be able to judge the situation. He watched as one of the men-at-arms took a swipe at Corbus with a long-handled axe. The knight's sword clove through the man's shoulder, and his return stroke sent the soldier's screaming head bouncing across the square. Yes, definitely better to keep himself in reserve, Feather concluded. Brunner watched from the shadow of an alley as Feather's men sprung the ambush. He had to admit that the trap was a convincing one. It spoke volumes about how desperate the aristocrats of Musilon were to be rid of Marimond, that they should invest so many resources and so much effort in what was little more than a diversion. As the bounty hunter watched the crimson-clad Sir Corbus hack a chunk of meat the size of a melon from the side of a swordsman who had foolishly pressed the assault, Brunner also came to appreciate just how little human life meant to the same aristocrats. They would expend the lives of their own men without compunction or care, seeing them just as another resource to be gambled and replaced. The bounty hunter shrugged. Dwelling in a disease-ridden pest hole like Musilon, he could understand how the value of human life might become a bit skewed in the minds of the city's nobility. Ironically enough, it looked as though Feather might actually stand a chance of succeeding with the ambush. Brunner could see two of the red and grey clad halberdiers lying on the ground, and one of those who had yet remained was favoring his left leg, and the ghastly slash that had been dealt to it by an opponent's spear. Of Feather's men, only four of the ambushers had been taken out of action, three of them the handiwork of Sir Corbus. Always a quick judge of the fighting prowess of prospective enemies, the bounty hunter was suitably impressed by the amazing speed and brutal strength the knight possessed. It was almost as if someone had stuffed an ogre into the suit of red plate mail and then given it a heavy dose of crimson shade. Brunner had seen orcs sometimes work that sort of maiming, mutilating force that was behind Corbus's sword, but orcs did so with much less skill and efficiency. Still, Brunner calculated that even a formidable foe like Sir Corbus must eventually acknowledge the simple weight of numbers arrayed against him. Feather still had eighteen men, 
pitted against Sir Corbus and his two surviving halberdiers. It was time to shift the odds. The bounty hunter emerged from the alleyway, his prized repeating crossbow clutched in his gloved hands. Without warning, or waiting for feathered soldiers to notice him, Brunner fired into the black-mantled attackers. His first bolt tore through the back of an axeman, harrying the injured halberdier. The force of the impact, spinning the axeman and causing his body to roll as it struck the ground. The second shot exploded the shoulder of a swordsman who had hoped to exploit an opening in Sir Corbus's greatly beleaguered defenses. The man cried out, dropping the sword from his now useless arm. Alerted to the backstabber's presence, Corbus spun, his own blade neatly opening the injured man's windpipe. Two spearmen were the objects of Brunner's remaining shots, both men lingering at the fringes of the body of attackers, awaiting an opening through which to thrust their weapons. One of the men screamed in agony as his knee was pulped by the powerful steel missile, falling to the dirt and clutching his wound. His comrade, turning to see what had happened to the other spearman, was rewarded with the last bolt, the steel dart crunching into the man's lower jaw. He crumpled into a gargling mass of agony. The swift, brutal attack had its desired effect. The men-at-arms became disordered, their slow, methodical effort to whittle away the defenses of Corbus and his men, broken by Brunner's unexpected attack. The bounty hunter smiled beneath his helm as he saw several of the black and gold liveried soldiers turn towards him, obscene Bretonian oaths spilling from their lips. He knew that Feather had been informed as to the true purpose of the ambush, but it would be just like the cold, calculating mind of the man's master to also withhold that information from the men who would be doing the actual fighting. After all, the ambush had to be realistic. Brunner let his crossbow hang from the leather strap that was affixed to its stock and wrapped about his own shoulders. The bounty hunter replaced it with the cold steel of Drake's malice and the gaping barrel of the pistol. He suspected that the men rushing toward him did not so merely from anger at the bounty hunter's intrusion into their trap, but from thoughts that Brunner would provide a much easier kill than Sir Corbus. The bounty hunter smiled grimly once more. That was an illusion he would very quickly dissuade them of. The foremost of the men-at-arms was thrown back as Brunner's pistol sent a bullet slamming into the man's chest. The loud report of the firearm was amplified by the narrow square, causing weird echoes as the sound danced amid the broken walls and rotting shingles. The three men who had followed after him came to a stop, as though they had struck an invisible wall. Gunpowder was a rare thing in Bretonia, and seldom employed in weapons. To the men-at-arms, the sudden death of their companion seemed an act of sorcery, and it was with the awe and horror of such dark magics that they regarded the smoking ruin left at the center of his torso. Brunner did not allow the men time to snap out of their shock, lunging forward into their midst before they had time to recover. The bounty hunter's longsword slashed down the shoulder and chest of one of the startled spearmen, dropping him before he could even raise his weapon. The swordsman beside him was given a killing thrust to the stomach, Drake's malice's keen edge tearing through the antique leather armor that enclosed the man's body as easily as parchment. The third attacker saw the bleeding bodies of his comrades and gave voice to a pathetic cry of terror, flinging his weapon from him and running with all speed for the nearest alleyway. Brunner looked up from his handiwork, not surprised to see that the other remaining men-at-arms had fallen into a rout, scattering across the hay market like rats flying from a sinking ship. Three more of their number had been killed, the bodies bearing the butchering wounds of Sir Corbus's sword. The Red Knight was glowering at the fleeing men, clenching his mailed fists in silent frustration.
Then his gaze turned toward the storehouse at the far end of the square. The knight stooped and lifted a halberd dropped by one of his slain soldiers. Corbus lifted the heavy weapon in his hand as though judging its weight and balance. Before Brunner could grasp what the knight was doing, Corbus drew his body back and threw the heavy halberd across the square as effortlessly as though it were a javelin. The halberd crashed into the door of the storehouse with a meaty thunk and a shriek of splintered wood. The rotten wood of the door gave way as the dead weight behind it toppled forward, the blade of the halberd embedded in the dead man's chest. The bounty hunter decided that Feather should probably have found a better place to hide. The Red Knight turned away from his amazing feet, a deep and satisfied smile on his face. He paused, staring intently at the bloody carnage all around him, then made his way toward the bounty hunter. He found Brunner recovering his crossbow bolt from the skull of a spearman. Corbus paused long enough to stamp the throat of the corpse's injured comrade beneath his armored boot. The bounty hunter pretended to pay no attention to the knight's advance, discreetly sliding the hilt of Drake's malice around so that it might be easily drawn. Your advantage this affair was opportune, Corbus growled down at him. I find myself wondering why. You are not one of Duke Merriman's men, and any man who would strike his enemies from behind and at distance is hardly going to take offense at an uneven fight. There was both challenge and suspicion in the knight's voice, and Brunner had the impression that it was but the tip of a vast iceberg of rage boiling within the knight. You are quite correct, Brunner replied with an elaborate calm stuffing the recovered bolt into a leather box fixed to his belt. I have no scruples when it comes to a fight. Results are what matter, not outmoded concepts of honor on the battlefield. The handsome features of Sir Corbus contorted into a feral snarl as the bounty hunter voiced his disdain for all rules of combat. For a moment, Brunner froze, wondering if perhaps he had overplayed his hand, antagonized the knight beyond any traces of gratitude Corbus might be entertaining. The knight's hand closed about the grip of his sword and did not move from there. After a tense moment of silence, Brunner continued, I spent some time watching the fight before deciding which side to help. He admitted at last, moving to recover the bolt that had exploded the other spearman's knee. Then why did you help me? Corbus demanded. The bounty hunter stared into the knight's burning eyes. I reasoned that your enemies had everything rather well in hand. Brunner told him. Certainly they might lose a few more men to your admirable swordsmanship, but in the end they would carry the day, and they would hardly be interested in hiring a passing mercenary who so fit to invite himself to their ambush. You, on the other hand, looked as though an extra man might come in handy. You might be interested in engaging the services of a warrior who helped pull your bacon from the fire. Corbus shook his head, snorting with contempt. They had no real hope of victory. No matter how many of them they sent, I would have killed them all. There is not a sword in Musilon that has yet to impress me. The knight's voice fairly dripped with scorn and frustration. Brunner realized that Corbus was not boasting when he said that he could have slain twenty foes on his own. The man truly believed it. Brunner wondered if there was a sane knight to be found anywhere in Musilon. The knight gestured at the bodies strewn about, several of them Brunner's handiwork. Your skill with the blade is not entirely beneath contempt, Corbus admitted grudgingly. But your tactics display no discipline, no nobility. The knight sneered at Brunner. <laughs> 
Such a man is like a wolf, a savage beast unworthy of trust, unworthy of honor. Perhaps your master will see things otherwise, Brunner retorted, especially as you've lost two men this day, perhaps three, if your master does not have a healer in his employ. Corbus turned to gaze at his remaining men. The unharmed halberdier was helping the wounded one limp his way across the square. After a pause, the knight nodded his head. What you say is true, Selsord, Corbus said. Duke Merriman's forces have been diminished as a result of this treacherous attack. He may indeed find a use for even an honorless dog such as yourself. The knight paused again, displaying his gleaming teeth in a mirthless smile. At least until warriors of quality can be found. Brunner was led away from the carnage of the Haymarket, back to the castle of Duke Marimond. Corbus was at the head of the little procession, the two halberdiers following in his wake, with Brunner forming the rear guard. The Red Knight paused several times to flash a hostile glare back at the bounty hunter, seemingly annoyed to find that Brunner was still there. The journey took rather longer than Brunner had expected, winding through the rotting, dilapidated husk of the old city. Corbus seemed utterly unconcerned that they might encounter any wandering patrols in the service of Merriman's enemies. The memory of Corbus's insane boast that he could have prevailed against twenty enemies did nothing to ease Brunner's concerns. However, as luck or fortune would have it, the only people they encountered in their trek were some scrawny peasants, who quickly took flight back into the shadows of their hovels. Finally, when the position of the now distant ruin of Duke Malford's castle told him that they were nearing the landward edge of the city, Brunner saw the black mass of Merriman's fortress rise from the squalor. It must have started its existence as a gatehouse, the bounty hunter decided, that role no doubt voided as the swamp beyond the walls had continued to grow in its rapacity and the once vibrant port of Musilon became choked with mud, squalor, and ill favor. With its old role voided, one of the aristocrats of the city had taken it upon himself to expand the old fortification, adding a curtain wall that formed a large courtyard. Towers had come later, and then still another curtain wall. Brunner could imagine all the homes and shops that had been leveled to make room for the castle's expansion. The result was something as defended from an attack originating from the city as the unlikely event of an attack issuing from the depths of the swamp. A narrow trench surrounded the three sides of the castle that were within the confines of the city's outer wall. The depression had filled with seepage from the swamp, foul stagnant water from which reeds and lily pads protruded. Brunner stared at the moat as they made their way toward the drawbridge that spanned it, surprised to find a reptilian eye staring back at him from the scum that floated upon it. Apparently, swimming hole was not one of the moat's other functions. Sir Corbus dismissed the other two halberdiers after the group had passed over the drawbridge and beneath the steel portcullis that loomed above the castle gate. The two men hobbled away to find relief for the injured man's wounds. Corbus paid them no further attention, instead focusing his intense stare on Brunner, snarling for the bounty hunter to follow him, if he still intended to see Duke Marimond. The Duke's throne room was not unlike every other great hall Brunner had been conducted into within the realm of Bretonia. A good deal shabbier, to be certain, but much the same. Trophies hung from the walls, mostly taking the form of the heads of mighty beasts slain in single combat by the valiant knights of the household, but scattered amongst them were the odd banner of some invading army and the helmet of a vanquished rival. The animal heads were showing signs of mold and rot, 
the old helmets starting to display, the rust quietly gnawing at them. Brunner imagined that Duke Merrimond did not spend a great deal of his wealth on servants. The great hall in particular displayed the marked lack of a woman's touch. Merrimond himself was seated in a high-backed chair of some dark wood that had been polished to a bright shine. Brunner guessed that it could even be crafted from mahogany, a rare wood originating in the stinking jungles south of Araby. If such were the case, it was a relic from the days of Musilon's prosperity, and as such, a valuable symbol for any man whose ambition was to restore that prosperity. Any noble brought before Merrimond could not fail to note the antique exotic chair and recall the splendor that had once made such things commonplace in the halls of the aristocracy. The duke was a less imposing sight. Of no extraordinary stature or physical strength, he was fairly dwarfed by the hulking knight he had chosen to be his champion. Indeed, the features of Merriman's face were soft, though with a cunning quality about them. The noble's dark eyes were studious, cold, and had a calculating shine to them. The duke wore his black hair cropped short in the rounded fashion favored by many Bretonians. His clothes were simple, a red tunic upon which was worked a rampant wolf in silver thread. The duke's leggings were gray, his boots black leather polished to a shine that rivaled that of his throne. A silver belt, inlaid with gemstones, circled his waist, a small jeweled dagger hanging from it. The duke's keen eyes studied Brunner for a moment. Merrimond turned to mutter a command to the two soldiers who flanked his throne, then returned his attention to Corbus and his guest. News has already reached my ears, Merrimond stated, of the aid you provided my champion when he was attacked by the treacherous forces of the malcontents within my city. The seated noble extended a hand that was heavy with jeweled rings to indicate the glowering red knight. It is seldom that Sir Corbus is in need of assistance. However, however, you have the gratitude of Musilon's rightful liege lord. Brunner took a step forward, ignoring the surly snarl that hissed from Sir Corbus. I am but a humble warrior, my lord. Brunner told the seated nobleman, If I have earned enough favor with your excellency that you may see fit to hire my sword, then such is reward enough. Reward? repeated Merrimond, as though the word was strange to him. You would have me engage your services as a way of repaying the assistance you gave my champion? A cruel smile spread across Merriman's features. Are you not content to serve a single master? The duke asked, his voice maintaining its cool, unemotional tone. Do you think I am unaware of your identity, Brunner? Nor why you have come here, assassin. As Merriman spat the last word, the guards flanking his throne surged forward. The bounty hunter, his body already tense, coiled for the attack was in motion even before Merriman's guards had started to move, drawing his sword and pistol. Brunner was not exactly certain what had gone wrong, but the bounty hunter vowed he would not go down without taking several of his enemies with him. Quick as the bounty hunter was, he was not quick enough. With a speed that Brunner would have judged to be impossible, Sir Corbus lunged at him, the knight's armored hands closing about Brunner's own. The bounty hunter struggled in the powerful grip, feeling the awesome strength of Corbus as the knight's gauntlets clenched tighter. Brunner cried out in pain, unable to maintain his grip on his pistol. The weapon clattered to the floor, quickly recovered by one of Merriman's guards. Brunner fought against the incredible pressure, striving to maintain his grip on Drake's malice. But it was like struggling against a bear 
the bounty hunter's efforts seemed to go unnoticed by the Red Knight. Sir Corbus began to lift his arms, pulling Brunner upward so that only the tips of his boots maintained contact with the floor. Then the knight began to twist his grip, savaging Brunner's wrist, until Drake's malice began to slide free of the bounty hunter's wavering clutch. Brunner snarled through the red tide of pain pulsing through his body. Leaning back as far as he could, he sent his head smashing forward, the black steel of his helmet crunching against the knight's exposed face. Corbus gave voice to his own snarl, tossing the bounty hunter across the room as though he weighed no more than a child. Brunner struck the marble floor on his side, skidding across the polished stone. The impact forced the air out of his lungs and succeeded in tearing his sword free of his grip. The bounty hunter rolled onto his back, dazed by his fall. Corbus glared at the prone bounty hunter with eyes that no longer resembled anything human, but glowed red with the dim light of the great hall like twin pools of blood. The greasy, translucent treacle that flowed from where Brunner's helmet had broken the knight's nose was no such thing as should flow through the veins of mortal men. The knight stalked forward, not deigning to draw his blade. I generally do not lower myself to preying upon beasts. Corbus hissed, his voice brimming with fury. But I find myself of a mind to make an exception. The knight smiled again, this time displaying his powerful wolf-like canines. The enraged vampire reached down and gripped the front of Brunner's armor, lifting him from the floor with one hand while the other bent the bounty hunter's head back, exposing his neck. He is of no use to you, dead, a soft, melodious voice cautioned. During the combat, another figure had emerged from behind the duke's throne, a tall, slender woman garbed in a red flowing gown. She laid a delicate pale hand upon the armrest of Merriman's throne. Ah, smirked the nobleman, but it is so rare that I am allowed to enjoy watching Corbus do what he does so very well. Merriman seemed to revel in the momentary flicker of disgust that crossed the woman's sharp, striking features. It can be dangerous to indulge such distractions, my lord, the woman told him. This man may know things that we do not. For instance, can you be certain that your enemies have repeated their past error and sent only one assassin? The enchantress hid the satisfaction she felt as she saw Merriman's eyes droop with a mixture of doubt and concern. You are quite right as usual, my dear, Merriman concurred. It might be rash to waste such an opportunity out of hand. Corbus! The nobleman's shout froze the vampire. The undead knight turned to regard its lord. I want a man alive! Merriman decreed. The vampire scowled, as though it had eaten something rotten, but relinquished its grip upon the bounty hunter, letting his body fall none too gently onto the marble floor. A wise decision, my lord, the elf maiden told Merrimond. There are spells I can employ to pry information from this man, information that might be of benefit when dealing with the men who sent him here. Your sorcery certainly does have its uses, Merrimond replied, his voice as cold as a serpent's. But I am afraid that I am still a bit old-fashioned when it comes to matters of torture. He redirected his attention to the still glowering Sir Corbus. Take that scum to the dungeons, Merriman declared, punctuating his remark with an imperious wave of his hand. Make him regret the day he was ever born, the nobleman added. Just see that he remains alive. Corbus grinned, reaching down and lifting the dazed bounty hunter once more. 
The huge knight waved aside the guards who came forward to help with its burden, striding toward the great hall's exit, as though the man he carried weighed no more than a chicken. From beside the throne, the elf enchantress, Ithilwale, watched the vampire depart, a worried expression on her face. Do not fret so, Mariman consoled her. If Corbus does not get the information we require from the assassin with his methods, then we can always try your sorcery later. It should not be of any great importance if your subject is a little worse for wear, or missing the odd finger or two. The wind howled, gnawing at the fragile walls of the griffin's nest. It was a fell, stagnant zephyr, thick with the stink of smoke and death. Under its unseen assault, the thatch roofing began to be stripped away, disappearing from the ceiling in ragged clumps. The proprietor of the inn, old Gaspard, emerged from the heavy bundle of fur blankets that covered his sleeping form. He squinted into the tearing sting of the wind, watching as the, watching as the furs and strips of cloth he used to cover the holes in his establishment's walls danced and writhed in the gale. The sound was like thunder, a deafening din that grew ever louder. Gaspard rose to his feet, at once struck by the foul stink that filled the air, a sickly evil smell that caused the bile to rise in his throat. Some of the guests of the inn were already stricken by the loathsome stink, spilling their dinners into the muck that passed for the floor of the griffin's nest. Gaspard, through determination, kept his own dinner in its proper place and staggered into the bar room. The old man's mind was at a loss to explain what was happening. Storms were common enough, but they had savaged his ramshackle dive more than once in the past. But this felt different somehow. This breeze was not cool, but hot, almost sweltering. Then there was the abominable stench. The innkeeper determined to look outside and discover if the smell had afflicted the rest of the village or simply his own establishment. Perhaps a lodger had died the past night and gone unnoticed. As suddenly as it had begun, the gale abated. However, though no more thatch was stripped away and the fur wall hangings ceased to dance and sway, the sound of the wind had not abated. It was still as discernible as ever, rasping like some mammoth bellows. And the sickly smell had grown as well. Abruptly, the entire building shook, rocked as though a giant had kicked the inn's foundations. Gaspard was thrown to the floor, and it was only with some difficulty that a one-armed man regained his feet. He could hear curses of annoyance and fear sounding in the darkness as his guests reacted to the sudden tremor. What was going on? The innkeeper asked himself. Stealing himself to find the answer, Gaspard reached out and threw open the front door. A blast of withering heat caused him to cover his face, the overwhelming concentration of the evil stench making him stagger. As he blinked through tearing eyes, he saw a shape beyond the doorway, but it was only a small part of some far vaster hole. There was an impression of powerful muscles, red scales and black claws. A hissing shriek, such as might herald the murder of the sun, shook the night. The innkeeper screamed as he clamped his hand to his bleeding ears, the terrible roar having ruptured them. Then the ceiling crashed inward, brought to destruction by the gigantic clawed foot that smashed down upon it from above. The sight of the timber and thatch rushing down upon him was the last to fill the horrified eyes of Gaspard. He was already dead when the flames came, rushing through the griffon's nest, consuming wood and flesh and stone with equal ferocity. And as the inn burned, there sounded once more the hissing roar of something that was already ancient 
when men were finding names for their gods. In the morning, only a stretch of blackened slag marked the place where the griffin's nest and the village that had surrounded it had once stood. The few survivors hid beneath rocks deep within the surrounding woods, their minds half broken by the awesome force that had annihilated their homes and families. In frightened whispers, they gave a name to the mighty destroyer, a name as ancient as that of any god. The name of Dragon.